Welcome to our channel. For those of you who are new around here, we're Paltai International and we created a sculpting medium called Paltai Premium that looks and feels just like clay but cures stone hard. Check out our other videos to see for yourself what's possible. Please note, this was filmed over several weeks and our studio is underneath a flight path, so there may be some distractions and noise but we try to keep that to a minimum. We hope it doesn't distract from your viewing pleasure. Hi, I'm Kim Beaton, and today we're going to be making the most amazing water feature. This little beautiful thing is going to be constructed a meter, almost three feet tall with a working water pump. Now this is based on Han Nan Bo. This is a Vietnamese miniature landscape technique that's been around for a thousand years. It means island, mountain, forest, and it is gorgeous. It's influenced Japanese bonsai, it's even influenced modern works like James Cameron's Avatar. How do you design it? How do you build it? How do you put a working pump into it? And more particularly, how do you make it look beautiful? There are a lot of design decisions that have to go in to making something like this, and some of them are pretty tricky. We're going to discuss all of them. You're going to follow me along on a really raucous path as we make a truly gorgeous garden feature. Today I am with Richard Robinson. He is an accomplished artist and filmmaker, and he's going to be joining me on this entire process of building this lovely piece. So what do you think, Richard? I'm ready. Though I, I have a question. Why are we working in tinfoil? Tinfoil is my favorite medium of sketching and maquetting. Now, maquette, M-A-Q-U-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. What that means, it's a sculpture sketch. It's meant to be loose, easygoing, fast, so you get an idea but it never intended to be a finished piece. Right. Tin foil allows me to sculpt something like this up in about two hours. And it solves wow. a lot of problems because I'm gonna have a working pump in here, right? Right, and we gotta figure out where, it, where it's gonna sit. It doesn't poke out to yeah. one side. And it allows me to make decisions like this. I have to have access to the inside to the mechanisms. So there's gonna be a roof. Again, this is gonna be a meter high and I'd like to solve all of these technical problems in foil in advance. A door. We need a door here, but we don't want a door on a hinge. We need a gravity fit door, which is it so slots, slots in. in place and then we can pull it out again. Right. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. And presumably that's why we're using chains and not just pouring water on it right now? When we're working on the final one, we will be pouring water on it to make sure we can assess and correct the flow so it cascades correctly. In a maquette, these chains one, point where the water's going. You know what you're trying to construct because where the water's flowing is part of the aesthetic. It has to be pretty. These chains give the life and the movement that actually exist in water and it's cheap and cheerful. You just hot glue them on. Cool, that sounds excellent. <laughs> By the way, everyone, this is Andrea. And hi. I'm Kim. <laughs> and we're gonna build an absolutely awesome water feature today. We so, are rolling. Okay. Um, we have a uh, maquette here. I want this maquette to be large enough. Now, here's a trick. This is about 900 high. Now, standing up on this tabletop where we're gonna be sculpting it, this looks big, right? Yeah. Until you put it on the ground, which is where it's going to be shown. If you put that thing on the ground. Can't see it. And you can't even see it, it's too darn tiny. And there's always a trap with a sculptor is that it, where you're sculpting it at will give you the wrong information. Um, and the, so if I sculpt it eye level, it means it has to be displayed eye level because all the lines and the composition will be perfect at this height. Thing is, this is too damn short. This is the height of my table. Um, so I'd like it that height. Now I know this is off camera, but this height, when I put it on the ground, this looks like a gorgeous fountain that I could, I could truly get into. How can I see this? Rough ups. So this fundamentally, this is a diamond shape, right? It's a diamond. Yeah. So is that. So if I do this, oh, I see. and I say, that's my floating diamond, a diamond that is this tall is very different from a diamond that's that high. They physically 
involve the space that you're in differently. And I want mass. I want this to be impressive. I want people to look at this and go, oh my God, I want that. And right. so the bigger, the better, but we don't want to bust our budget. So <laughs> I'm looking at dude. <laughs> that. If that's our triangle, this triangle has to go from here and its point just hovers. So that triangle is suddenly that big. Oh. See how massive that is? Yeah, Ooh. I didn't realize how far down it went. That's uh -huh. a good point. So first and foremost, we build a cardboard cross section that gives us the visual mass, we put it on the ground, and we see, I mean, do we have a visceral impression, is it too big? Right. I don't want to build something that we're going to regret. And we're going to make a cross section. Shall yeah. I move yeah. this? Yeah, move that. So, don't get too precious about doing work like this, because it'll just slow you down. So if that's my height, can I have you move the card? That's my height. Good. That's almost off the side. And we've got that. If I do that. Okay. I'm going to draw a diamond here. And it looks, it's a high-sided diamond, which means it's high and then a long side. This is, mm -hmm. it hits here, goes to about the two-thirds mark up. So it's almost a, like a kite shape? It's a kite shape. Dry. Bingo. So, is that wide enough? So you Hold see it here, <laughs> it's one-third, two-thirds. And so I need a diamond that is about that configuration. I don't have to be precious about it because we're sculpting in foil. So I'm going to make it a bit bigger. There. We're going to hot glue this together and set it up right like a kite. And we're, then we're going to look at it again. Again, be really loose when you're doing this kind of work. I mean, don't get precious about it. It's just, not a mathematical equation. It's not a mathematical equation. It's, hey, we just want an answer. It's a, yeah. Okay. It's a mock-up. No, it's a mock-up. Now, physically, I put that up. How oh, massive. Yeah. See how massive that it just it fills so, the room? It's like, oh my god, this thing yeah, is suddenly it to... gargantuan. Yeah. However, this is the wrong eye height. Right. It's this big. Yeah, it comes up about what to chest height yeah. on a not very that? tall person. So <laughs> physically, when I see this. Does that feel like it would be a good pool? Because it might even still feel small. Um, I'm wondering if it feels the, the the upward angle feels a little shallow, to be honest, compared to what you oh, have. Oh, we'll, we'll tinfoil it up. Okay. We'll have, but this just says because if we want it up this big, yeah, that would suddenly increase the entire volume. Mm. Mm. Um, well, I was wondering about bringing it into the middle a little bit. But... You think it should come into here? Well, maybe. So it's I, more... You want I, I'm to just start? the camera guy. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, that we can turn that. If you, you think that's a little high. Yeah, to give it that, like, craggy Steeper mountain. Look. Yeah. Yeah. So we can move. That's, that's what models like this are for. If this set feels wrong, then you, you go with your gut. Yeah. So that... Okay, I'm going to have you hold that. Yeah. And we've got these spare pieces around. Okay. Cross section. Oh, to get the... That's, that feels... I like that. That feels, because that's the widest part. This is the widest part here. I look at that and I go, yeah, I, I can deal with that. Right. That's our size. I am happy. Yeah. I'd be very excited to <laughs> yeah, so come that's across a, this in a garden. So yeah, so that's going to be our height, and that's going to be our cross section there. So okay. as massive as it seems, this is not going to be that big. It just is. It's only a meter high. We have to put a box on this. Again, you could waste a lot of tin foil. Tin foil is going to cost you 20 bucks to fluff it out, but it's going to cost you time. So. We want to make a false box. Sheets of cardboard. And I'm going to dent this like that. I don't want to cut all the way through it. Okay. 
so I pierce that side. Oh, so that's why you did it with a screwdriver? Right. I always like to try and make sure cardboard is out. Now I'm gonna glue that. So uh, I just do a little wiggle like that. And I put that. Or the, yeah, the non-printed side goes out. That makes sense. Do try to make cardboard the proper side go out because this will get really confusing really fast what it looks like. So again, put a nice little wiggle like that. We love that hot glue gun. Yes. We need a diamond, right? Right. Well, I think that diamond's gonna be about right here. That's a, that's a, wow, that was a Phillips head screwdriver. You got it? <laughs> so I'm gonna All do, part of the process. All part of the process, man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. That looks good. Now I'm going to get rid of this extra stuff because it will just get in my way. So I I don't know where that goes. I just think that uh, it could be kind of like that. Uh, yes, we will be then putting tin foil on top of this, uh -huh. right? This is just so our. I'm just going to make a guess. And again, I'm not doing this perfect. Yeah. I don't have to do this perfect. So, see, now because I have that flap there, mm. I have the ability to go, ooh, is that? I see. So you can sort of That's move it around probably and get pretty it exactly close. where you like it. Yep. Right. I'm gonna glue that. I'm gonna glue that. This is the, the first draft of the first draft. So it's extra. Yeah, I'm gonna pull out. I'm going to yeah. puff out from here. Get rid of the extra. Come on. Don't leave there. To this point, I've made part of the false box. How big is that sculpture now? Oh, yeah. Suddenly it pops up into the space that we're in mm -hmm. and physically it begins to have genuine mass. This also saved us about you know, 15 bucks in um, tin foil. Yeah. So I've also split it. See, split it like that because right. I do need the top to come off. And we've got these extra fins here. I'm going to just bend them. There. Now they're out of the way. So the lid, this might be an entirely tin foil seam mm. and it'll still lift off. Right. So we need to. And then we make a false box on the other side. It does look like it's going out further that side than it is that side. Oh, that, that side might become the front. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. We're not, <laughs> we're not doctoring it. So we're moving pretty at a good clip. Yeah. I'm um, doing a false box. Uh, we'll save you so, so very much time. Yeah. Hmm. Oh. I, I have an idea. Ding. Is if we create a sheen that just sits right over the top of this, mm. then the lid will just slide onto it like a post. Oh. So you're creating almost like a like a channel for the, the, yeah. the post to, to go through? Yeah, we can do that. It yeah. just slots onto it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's going to make taking it off and putting it on much easier. Okay. We're ready to start putting tinfoil on this. Now, a couple of things I want to bring up really fast. This is our sculpture. There's going to be a pump encased in this mountain that feeds up the water. That's our pump. Now, the reason I have it here is we have to make sure that we build a mountain big enough to hide that in. So it's there also to remind us during this process. <laughs> For now, though, we're going to pull this aside and we're going to rip tinfoil. This is the best sculpting material there is on the planet for a whole bunch of reasons. And I kind of say that laughingly, but genuinely it works because you have access to it. 
It's really inexpensive. <laughs> How it's done. Drop it like that. Rip off a piece. And then see, so shiny. Always put shiny side in, dull side out. And I'm folding it to capture as much air as possible into a spheroidal shape or popcorn shape. That, the way I said, air is free. <laughs> air is, in fact, air is so, the cheapest part of this. Put as much free stuff in this as you can afford. So we are going to rip off. It's too sparkly if you put the shiny side out. You can't see your sculpture. It really interferes with your ability to perceive a three-dimensional item if it's all sparkly. There is a certain magic to making hot glue work on these little guys. Okay, we folded it in together to that round area. What I want to do is capture all the edges. So I go around those. That's it. That's how fast. Yep. Go around all those edges. Around those edges. Because that'll keep it from sort of peeling up, right? Yep. It keeps it from peeling up. And we are now going to cover the whole front of this. And when it's covered, we'll begin to pop out the certain rocks and features that we want. So you get that hot glue gun and I'm going to get the other one. When, I, when we started this, I didn't account for this notch. Now this core is tinfoil, so I need to cut this notch in here, and that's what I'm doing. I'm chipping away at bits and pieces of it to make that armature more. When we were building this core, we were in a hurry. We want to just get the answer of whether we're doing it right or not fast. Now we have to kind of back up a little bit and chop and change it a little. And we're okay, it's cardboard. Do what you need. Mm. Mm. We're slowing down and making sure we have our points of interest, or essentially the thing that determines where all the important architecture is. This point here is important, that point, this point, that point, and on that side, I'm thinking this point here, or which one? Which one's most important that, to you? That second one you pointed to. I this think. one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. where it comes up. So what we're gonna do is quickly, rapidly pop up these specific points. Mm -hmm. When they're in alignment, then we'll inflate the rest of the sculpture to match those crucial points. Okay. And so, yeah. <sighs> oh, it uh, really is starting to look <laughs> like a thing. <laughs> Looking like a thing. So we're gonna start up here. This is where our water is gonna come out. We want a waterfall down into our blue pool. It's already blue, yay. <laughs> then it's gonna come off this pool, down a tumble of rocks, into what we're calling the main pool. It's the biggest one. Right. And then sandwiched between this ridge line here and this ridge line here, in this little gully, is where we're gonna build our little meteora style monastery. Yep. Oh look, more rocks. <laughs> and then we're gonna have two main waterfalls. There's this one into a small pool, into a small pool, and that becomes our single largest waterfall, longest waterfall, I should say. But we're also going to have it come off this side into this small pool here and split into this small pool, which will come off to the left here and to the right. We are continuing to work on our large scale Hanan bow sculpture. This is our floating mountain garden fountain. And today we will be concentrating specifically on getting this rock work cleaned up. Right now it looks like a bunch of balls of tin foil, but it's going to clarify in very short order. This side will end up looking very much like this side. Now how that's achieved is we've put pointings and edges on each one of the clumps and that makes it look a lot more like rocks. Now, I'll show you an example of what we're going to be going for. This is a little garden planter I made a couple of years ago, and it is a floating rock. Now there's different variations. You have a face, and then you have a striated edge. 
and that gives them the sense of a series of stacked cards. And that's what we've done here. We've chosen a flat face and then a striated edge that will make it three-dimensional and keep the rocks lined up as we rotate around the sculpture sculpting. So that is gonna look very much like this planter. The other thing that maybe you've noticed we've changed is that it's come up a little bit and we've separated it from its original base. We wanted to be able to turn it. Again, it's on a uh, race or turntable, Lazy Susan, whatever you want to call it. So we can move it around, work here, work there. So don't be afraid to change your armature. <laughs> what she said. Because sometimes our, the first armature we put on here was really rough as guts, but we wanted to get going. And sometimes you don't want to break the energy of just getting building. So use what you have on hand, because this is tin foil. You can come back, you can change these things. Yeah. Here is a great example of the kind of rocks that we can do. You see the striations, you can see the faces. This rock gives us a great look. Now, we can match this rock, absolutely. We can get something so indistinguishable from a real rock in this material. So this was painted by my good friend, Stephen Saunders. He likes very electric paint jobs and so do I. But to give you an example of how good our rock is, that's where it is. And that is a peanut butter jar what? that we sculptured <laughs> over the top of because we can light it up from the inside. Oh. And then you just set it back on. And it's a castle. So we're gonna put that in the yard, <laughs> wire it up for electric light. <laughs> Having a rock on hand that you can match is the most ideal way of doing it. Working right. off photographs is one thing. Now you can see our facets. See that facet there? Mm. See that facet or face? And that's what we're calling the striations is the little stuff in between. So there's a plane, there's a plane, there's a plane, a face. And then you have the striations in between that kind of create that card stacking level. Yeah. This yeah. is a gorgeous rock. I love how aged it is, but get even these steps here. That's that's Peltier Premium there. <laughs> and so you can match it. Yeah. Oh, wow. And we will we can create all of this gorgeous texture. I yeah, love this stuff. That looks like it was always there. That's neat. Mm -hmm. A lot of that comes from the paint. Yeah, look how knobbly and gnarly and rock-like this is. Mm -hmm. the, the rocks read even more clearly than they did before. Mm -hmm. We have to secure every last bit of this crumply down, which is great because I make, as I'm doing this, I'm falling in love with the sculpture. This is fun. It's really delightful to just keep putting all this stuff together and it brightens and the sculpture is only going to become better. Yeah. And I feel like in so much of art, you you have to be so careful to stop before you make it bad. But like with this step especially, <laughs> it's like, I don't have to worry about that. Just, no. yeah, just keep going. Keep going forever. <laughs> These are the, the faces and these are the striations. Now, when you're doing rocks, it is a series of faces that aren't necessarily facets. We're di differentiating one side from the other by calling one a striation. It keeps it clear and by doing that, I draw these lines on here that show the grain of the rock. This allows us to see that that is different from that face. And we're trying to keep them so they all match. This should look as if a giant god reached down into the earth and lifted up a chunk of a mountain in one piece and then parts of it kind of collapsed and shattered. So generally the grain has to work throughout just as it does in this single stone. How we're doing that? One felt tip pen keeps our lines rotating through the whole sculpture correctly. And two, it allows us to make a, a striated side. How to do this? Get a nice crumpled piece of foil and then tap it. And it makes these 
have some very subtle lines on it. They're there, that a pen would fall into. Then I choose a stone and I say, okay, that's my striated side right there. I apply a little bit of glue and then I press the striation in to that edge so that it reads clearly. And I draw some lines in it. So it's a shorthand. It's, it's a rough and tumble way to establish the correct direction on everything. When we cover this with a scratch coat, most of this detail is going to go away. So we have to make sure any amount of detail in here is loud and aggressive and wild because it's going to subtle quite down. We'll, we'll lose 20% of the dynamics when we put that scratch coat on there. Yeah, yeah, this is just as looking good. That's just, mm, look at those beautiful oh, I'm getting. Rocks. This sculpture is now complete. It's entirely inflated to its final size. To accommodate the thickness of the Paltaya Premium we're going to put over the whole thing, we now compress it down about a quarter of an inch in all directions. Now this will tighten up the sculpture. If anything's loose and moving, we'll glue it down because there's still a lot of shift happening here. We have to lock it. And uh, yeah, we'll cr compress it. Once it's compressed, then we'll put a coat on it. So there's areas here that are really quite loose and that we yeah. really have to reinforce all of this. And as we compress it, those areas are going to become apparent. Cool. Oh, yeah. There's no mistake that's absolutely fatal to a piece because this is a process that you can go in and out and in and out, forward, back, and reverse, uh, reverse at speed. <laughs> and so yeah. I like that freedom that even if we had to, we could crush it with a hammer later and mm -hmm. make <laughs> vast alterations. Yep. That's still my, my strongest memory of my first time with Paul Tai is Kim just coming in, bam, hammer, fix it. All right, let's go. Let's keep moving. It's great. People become really precious with their armatures and never let an armature <laughs> bully you into a decision you don't like, ever. Just don't. I mean, so we could finish this sculpture and I can still smash it back with a hammer and repair any area of it. Yep. And I'm still only using a limited number of tools, which is cool. Yep. So we're going to start compressing from the top down because as we compress, we're going to lose track of where we're at. Right. And it's best to start in one location and just slowly move down, compress, hot glue, compress, hot glue. Okay. That makes sense. I need a stool. Oh, <laughs> to, yeah. To keep the facets clear. Right. And if you can, remember how, how you point a corner? Like yeah. a spoon? Like a spoon. If you can be pointing corners on this, it will make it even more crisp. Our sculpture has now been completely compressed. You can see how different it is. See how all the textures are deep and gnarly, but they're still faceted and it looks stronger and more bouldery and heavier because we've caused it to be faceted. And that's one of the strong parts about doing rocks. You don't want your rocks to look flaccid and weak and rubbery. Keeping them crisp will make it work. I want to flip this part upside down to sculpt it because <laughs> when we put Paltaya Premium on here, it's going to want to fall off, just mm. thunk. However, if it's upside down, it's going to be here and it will be much easier to sculpt. This part already comes off. So we're going to pull this part off, put it over there, deal with it tomorrow, flip this upside down, prop it, and then put a scratch coat on this part. It's going to take us quite a while, maybe even a couple of days, to put a scratch coat on all of this, and that's okay. Yeah. Sound good? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. Yay! <laughs> Let's pull this off. Now it's going to shift a little bit, and that's fine. Okay, and there is our lovely floating rock. <laughs> there it goes. Over here. Flip it and put it back inside that hole. You can see it doesn't weigh very much. Yeah. 
And ah, now I grab the props and hot glue them in place again. We hope you enjoyed this video and come back next time in part two where Kim and Andrea and Taryn will be putting on the scratch coat surface and doing the rock formation of the water feature. And do become a Paltai Insider so you can get access to more bonus content.